Hey, Vanessa. How's Israel? You know you want to talk about weather. You know you do. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Actually, I wasn't thinking about the weather this time. I was passing by a house just earlier today that had a enormous placard saying this is Ben Gvir time and Ben Gvir to listeners who might remember that I talked about in my uh, dispatch podcast that um, we we plugged previously about the end we which we did discuss with Eli Lake a little bit is the the proto fascist um, party leader that got outsized um, influence in the past election and I don't know. It's just weird. It's not. It's not like you're seeing things immediately change. The government didn't even go into power. But there is this undercurrent, and undercurrents could be nothing. Undercurrents could be my own brain interpreting things that don't really exist. People who would have voted for him ten years ago voted for him today, and nothing really changed drastically. But on the other hand, you also hear a lot of conversations, political conversations. I mean, about implementing new. Um, Jewish Sharia law on certain things, um, blocking businesses on the Sabbath, being, being uh, introducing more um, religious moralistic dimensions into supervision of education. And those things just creep the fuck out of me, especially considering that we are in a political moment, I think, internationally or at least westernly, where there, there's just a ton of nostalgia for religious, I shouldn't say indoctrination so much as uh, coercion. People are craving coercion as we've discussed several times. People want that authoritative moral voice to submit to because they think their lives are empty without it. It's mm-hmm. just weird. They're looking you for see, strict daddies to put them in line. They're looking for strict daddies with God's <laughs> slappy rod. Uh-huh. It's just weird. Um, I, I don't know. I don't and know is, uh, is the gravel in your voice because of your uh, world wariness of the political climate? Or is it because of all the shouting you did at the World Cup match yesterday? <laughs> I, I did do some shouting, which is very unlike me. I do not watch sports, but it was a, <laughs> it was a delicious game. Um, it was a no, fucking good match. Yeah, it was a good match. You know, my, my raspiness is neither. As I just, my body decided, having moved here, that now, now it has an internal biological clock that wakes up at 6.30 no matter what. Um and I did, I did not go to sleep intending to wake up at 6.30, and hence the gravel. Got it. Gravel? I don't think you're groveling quite yet. It's a <laughs> gravelly tone. I think it's well suited to the end of the year wrap up. Just get that real feel of slogging through the year exhaustion right in your, right in your voice. No, yeah, groveling is not... <laughs> groveling goes back to what we were talking about with God's cropping rod. Ro- cropping rod? <laughs> yes. riding, riding crop. God's riding crop. Yeah. yeah, cropping rot sounds very sexual, but yeah. so too can be a riding crop. But anyway, I'm going to lead you into this conversation, Dom, since you are uh, un- underslept. Yeah, and, totally uh, out of character. Totally out of character. Um, but I thought we should have an end of the year discussion. Muse upon the three episodes we enjoyed most from the year and why. Mm-hmm. I have guessed what I think yours are. I'd be curious if you know what mine oh. are, and then we can, uh, and then we can discuss them. Hopefully, there's hopefully we don't diverge too much, and we don't have to have six conversations. Oh yeah, let's but we'll let's see. just reframe it from the conversations we enjoyed the most because I think there are just too many parameters that this could go. Let's mm. say the the one that like the ones that stuck with us in a in a in a u- unique way. Um, I'm overthinking it already. Okay. We're gonna keep it fun just for the new year, but I I, I agreed with Vanessa that sometimes we need to reflect. This is what the new <laughs> letters are for, sure, but also it's fun to do it kind of in person, except not. Speaking of fun reflections, so I listened to a bunch of our episodes from the year, which you know we we never do. We don't listen back. I, and I, I have to compliment to you. You you make our introductory banter, you make us sound kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's like way funner than real life. Right. Well no, le- significantly less tired, yes. That's what that's what I get paid for. But which you uh, don't I, get paid for. But if you did, not, you not would. Certain things, but yes. Uh yes, correct. Um but for other pods, yeah. But okay, so let's get started. So what do you want me to guess first? I want to guess. I want to guess first. Um no, no, no. I, I take it back. You go first. <laughs> Okay. All right. I think you're going to choose. Have you already figured it out in your mind so that I don't sway your 
opinion. Mm. Okay, give me a second. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, write this it one, down. This category for sure. Um, we had some some good conversations. I really like a lot of these conversations. I don't know, it's difficult to decide. Um, okay, so there are two categories already that I recognize. It's kind of cheating, but I'm going to put at least two in each category. So it's like, it's okay. actually the three that are five. Interesting. Okay, so I predicted that you would choose to talk about today uh, Mark Lila. There's Sean Jacobardi. And what was my third one? What was my third one? What was my third one? Yasha Monk. Damn. Good job. Wow. Did I get all three? The only thing that you missed for me, I mean, again, it's cheating <laughs> on my end because I, I I added more, but those are the three types that I have. Okay, so let's start with that. Mark represents... You should guess what mine are first. Okay, yes. I think Mark Lila is one of yours. I'm going to say... Okay, I'm going to say Eli Lake, because I think it amused you in a way that was different for you. So I'm going to go, like, probably Vishon still. Um, and maybe... The thing is that I can't decide between Mark Lila and David French because of the kind of, like, touching on the friendship issue. Uh, so just to go different, I'm going to go David French, Eli Lake, and Vishon. Okay, you got one out of three. Shit. Um, so Mark Lila instead of David French, <laughs> do I get that one? That's correct. Mark Lila uh, instead yeah, of David yeah. French. I, I, I knew it was going to be Mark Lila. It has to be Mark Lila. It was, so Mark, that was just a great conversation. And it was in person too, which I always like. Right. There was Vishon. Mm-hmm. So that was your right one. So it's one and a half, um, I'm going to call and, it. Fine, fair enough. And then the third one was actually Christine Rosen. Really? So, okay. So the thing, literally what I was thinking when I was thinking about categories, the two categories that I I had to bundle um, a few conversations into were, there was the topical, the two that I was considering was Eli and Christine. And I almost saw it as part of the same conversation, maybe because they are both in the commentary magazine sphere. And and then on the other side, there is the, um, there is the more cultural malaise, the loneliness and the uh, uh, search for meaning and the ways that that radicalizes society, which is David French and Mark Lila. So I, I'm i giving myself like a tenth of a point for calling Eli <laughs> because I saw it, I see it in the same bucket. Well, part of the reason why I liked the conversation with Christine, which we'll get into, is just how varied it was, which is mm. very similar to how the conversation uh, right. with Eli was. But yeah, did you want to start with Mark Lila then? Yeah, I think the reason that both of us landed on Mark Lila is that it really laid the groundwork, I think, of where we are intellectually in in what guides us in uncertain things. It got into not just the surface level dramas and and conflicts that we sometimes seek commentary on, but really got into some of the... M- fundamental movements, cultural and, and, and emotional movements that really undergird all of that. And I don't know if it's exactly, call it philosophical or sociological undulations, but it got to that. And, and I think that's something that both of us felt going out of that conversation. It was able to really grasp and, and explore and dissect deeper currents that we were just starting to tease out in our first conversation with Tom Holland, low those many years ago. And Tom Fresco. And Tom Fresco, correct. It's also interesting that we talked to Mark at the beginning of the year because he is a bit of a bridge interview in a way. He does kind of bring the through lines from year mm. one into year two of uncertain things. And I just appreciated, I mean, when you think about like back to our very first interviews with Tom Persico, a lot of the questions were like, how do we find a moral compass in a time when our moral compasses aren't given to us anymore. And for for me, what stood out from our conversation with Mark is that we had three questions that we could literally have like a million podcasts on each of these questions. And they're still just kind of sticking with me, which is how much morality is enough? What's the good of morality? Which is a question that seems a little out of favor these days, but I think is still worth talking about. Um, And when can we askew morality? Right. Do you say mm-hmm. a skew, not a stew? Oh, maybe it's a shoe. I don't know. A skew feels right. 
<laughs> um, I, I, I like the crunchiness of his shoe. When you say the good, we're talking about the the goal, the ultimate good, like big G good that is at, at the um, heart of it, of a moral system, how to define that, how to seek it out. And the the first question I think is even more interesting because I'd say that almost all of philosophy is in some way or another looking at the question of the good. Like, like, like I think you have, early you have philosophy, some, yes. Not necessarily kind of the more contemporary flavors of philosophy, right? No, I think they Because I think do. when I'm thinking of good, it's like what, what, what allows you to have a good life, right? Like that's, I think that's how he was defining it. Right. No, but the good, but then the good is what is the focus of the good? Is the good of the individual, the good of the social life, is the, the, the good of um, human existence? I think those questions around what is the, the locus of good and, and then how to define it are the, the bread and butter of, of philosophy, even not political or moral philosophy, because I think even when you're looking at questions about nature and truth and um, beauty, the, the elements of the good are defining the good is either explicit or implicit in the um, philosophical work. The thing that was to me more um, radical and satisfying in the way that Mark approached it is the question of delimiting just how much moral activity do you even want in society? How much how much preoccupation in um, questions of the good and of or righteousness or whatever version of um, applied morality can or should society actually um, encourage? So I think in that case. Um, when he's talking about the circumscribing morality, we're talking about morality as a group project, as a social project, because you can still discuss the question of the good outside of society and just man to themselves or, or man to nature or man to his vision of the infinite or the finite for that matter. But either way, working around these problems is, is both... I think like stimulating in, 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 a, in a way that I didn't expect in coming into this conversation. And second, incredibly pertinent to, and this is where the Tom Holland thing comes in, incredibly pertinent to a time where you are, we, I am um, trying to, uh, uh, or find myself in need of justifying the liberal system both to you and to um, potentially some of our listeners, definitely some of our guests, and certainly some of our non-guests who are, or, or are, I, I would love to talk to, but are ideologically um, far away from us. And the, I think the core justification of the liberal system is exactly that it um, sets out to carve out space for the individual that is outside of the concern of the social good. Yes, and Mark spent a lot of time talking about the your individual realm of curiosity and allowing that to be divorced from morality. Giving yourself permission in your interests, in your art that you consume, whatever, for it to be maybe not necessarily morally aligned with you. And that's actually healthy and a good practice. Um, and you can... can prescribe morality within maybe your more political life, which she drew pretty sharp divisions um, right. between uh, the personal and the political, which is also kind of interesting because, again, that's kind of not very uh, like, de rigueur is, these days. Right. Since the, the 60s ruined that. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> I remember a line that I, I mean, my, actually, I wonder if I could find it. I could probably pull it out um, on our copy here. But um, a line from Hitch 22 that me and my mom kept rediscovering and resharing between each other. He describes the his first encounter with the phrase, the personal is the political, and he's more of a, I, I don't like where this is going. This is, this is lazy. This is not a good way to, to, to think academically, philosophically, morally, and politically. Um, but it's funny because even as we acknowledge that a lot of what is personal is political, I think there's one thing to acknowledge that infiltration. It's another thing to live your life with that 
awareness and have every individual behavior defined by its political right. implication. It's like not a very healthy way to live your life. It's not just seeing it defined by the political implication. It's also there is a an assumption that every action has political implication, has political value. Right. And Import. yeah, and I think that's a problem. That that distorts your let's not even call it distort because to call it distort is judgmental, but it builds a new way to see the world that diminishes your ability to exist within yourself. Because now everything that you do is um, seen as part of the, the, uh, the, what's the, what's the word for the thing that you weave? You have a weaving thing. You spin the thing and you the spinning weave. wheel. No, the spinning wheel is the, the, the wheel that spins. But the, the thing that gets woven together is... <laughs> the loom. Uh, to, uh, the loom, okay. No, okay cool, it's got to cool. be a loom. I, I, well, I'm, I'm going to take your word for it. So. Is it every action that you... <laughs> every personal action that you take is only understandable within the loom of social politics. Now, as um, somebody who comes from the uh, constructivist school of linguistics... Uh, which is part of the reason that I am uh, a, a big Noam Chomsky protagonist. Uh, just side note, I would like us to return to Noam Chomsky and have sound effects because this is something I noticed for listening to our our episodes many times. We have promised it and have not delivered. And we I want this to be on a, Noam a Chomsky, future endeavor. Um, ominous theme. But yeah, exactly. I, I think but, but one of the reasons that I find myself antagonistic to Noam Chomsky is from the constructivist or structuralist school of linguistics. And the first idea that launched the school is understanding language as something that doesn't exist separate from the entire context. Um, white can only mean white in contrast to black, big only in contrast to small. Everything is contrasted and nothing exists in isolation. So as somebody who buys into the idea that that you can't really discuss a language this way, and language is really the thing through which we build our, our external relations as humans, the jump into everything is political as in every action that you make exists within this bigger tapestry of, of social interactions uh, is a very small jump to make. But but that's you know that's just philosophical bullshit at this point because obviously what you're when right. you're looking at it at the scale of people you can't really talk about it in that like abstraction in the same way that you do when you're thinking about language you have to think of it as we have individuals interacting and their actions do have some cumulative value as a bigger group and as a society and as a political system. But to forego the privacy of the individual in that story is a, a step too far, not just because we don't really think in those terms. We don't really think of ourselves as pieces of one big whole. That's not the way our brains think. That's not the way we understand ourselves. And that's not the way that we understand society, no matter how much we try to do it this way, to, to perceive it as this way. But the other side of this problem is that, and this is where we are today, when you forego this right to preserve the, the, the individuation and the liberal space um, and the idea of autonomy, you inevitably turn to a, a totalitarian system because that's the other side of that. It's a system that everything is submerged into the whole and into the interests of the whole and into the, the, the big mm. G good. And then you have no recourse. You have no way to be in dialogue with that because you're either, you, you're either in service of it or you're defying against it. Right. I, I will say that my mom listening on the <laughs> other side of the uh, room. Yes, live commentary. No, 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 she texted me the quote, the Hitch 22 quote. And I'll, I'll just read it and then we can decide if we want to include it. As 1968 began to ebb into 1969, however, and as anticlimax began to become a real world word in my lexicon, because at the time he saw himself as a socialist revolutionary. Mm. Um, the, a true believer in in the movements uh, around the world in Cuba and elsewhere, anti-Western um, transitions, um, he saw himself as a revolutionary. People began to intone the words, the personal is the political. At the instant I first heard this deadly expression, I knew as one does from the utterance of any sinister bullshit that it was, cliches are arguably forgiven here, very bad news. From now on, it would be enough to be a member of a sex or gender or epidermal subdivision 
or even erotic preference to qualify as a revolutionary. In order to begin a speech or ask a question from the floor, all that would be necessary by way of preface would be the words speaking as a. Wow. What year did he write that? Uh, I think 2008, maybe 2011. Um, and this could follow any self-loving description. I will have to say this much for the old hard left. We earned our claim to speak and intervene by right of experience and sacrifice and work. It would never have done for any of us to stand up and say that our sex or sexuality or pigmentation or disability were qualifications in themselves. There are many ways dating the moment when the left lost, or I would prefer to say discarded its moral advantage. But this was the first time that I was to see the sellout conducted so cheaply. It's a good quote. Yep. I talked about the way that this philosophy has a totalizing effect that I don't like. He points out that it also makes you lazy. And I think this also goes to what Mark Leela was talking about, Mm. that buying into this mode of seeing the world as being being actioned through your mere existence, that political action is earned by just existing as a certain identity group then you're no longer obligated to, to A, think critically on what you're trying to achieve, and second, to act in order to achieve that. It waters down what political means. Mm. And what, what you are morally obligated to do if you want to have political change. Right. <laughs> okay, on to Yasha. To Yasha. Uh, why did Yasha make your top three? Well, you tell me. You guessed it. I mean, one of the reasons why is because you got to test out your secret sauce question, which you had been workshopping Correct. quite a bit. I mean, I, to be fair, it's Yasha's um, work that really sealed it in my mind. And just in case people forgot, the secret sauce question is, is the secret sauce of group cohesion actually oppression? Not just cohesion, co- group meaning and being and, and the, the value of mm. a bond within a group, the thing that we keep lamenting the loss of in the atomized society of modern right. day America or modern day West the secret sauce is coercion. Um, can you have group commitments in a meaningful way, in a way that exerts people to to devote themselves to the group and to derive real meaning from their connection to that group without coercion, without a, a part of their brain mm-hmm. being afraid to leave? Um, the, the reason that it started, I don't know, congealing by reading Yasha's book is that in his text, Yasha is very much a warrior for classical liberalism and liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. So his agenda in his book is to defend a liberal, diverse society that enables uh, people to easily leave their groups, which he sees, sees as one of the duties of a liberal democracy, which means that the role of the state, of the government, to ensure that the individual has the freedom to exit any association that he finds himself into, whether Mm -hmm. by birth or voluntary association, but then decides to leave, call it a cult, call it a religion, whatever it is, the, the state must secure their freedom to join and exit as they please. And he took that for granted. And he insisted both in the book and in the interview that providing that security does not erode the value of the association in any way. His mind, mm-hmm. in fact, associations that have an element of coercion are, are cheaper and not something that we should even respect. But as I was reading it and as he was making his most um, thought out and articulate case for it, I was just not convinced. I was in fact being convinced further and further that Maybe not. Maybe really, like, maybe once you make it a free-for-all, where the state guarantees that you can just leave any group and redefine yourself in, in, in any which way, maybe in that, at that moment, you, you no longer see the group as something as gluey, as, as sticky as you would have otherwise, and in that you're getting a, a much more supine version of commitment. And that in part leads to a sense of adriftness and loneliness in the, again, 
Putin, Putin a mask, bowling alone, hyper individualized society. But this is a diagnosis for someone who isn't part of a strongly cohesive group within a liberal democracy, right? Because I think you made the point within the conversation that if you're in, say, Orthodox Jewish community within New York, it's not easy to leave, even within the framework of right. the Amer- America's liberal democracy, where it's you're allowed to leave, but you don't often. Right. I don't remember where Yasha himself stands on this, but this is definitely an instinct that exists among um, I'd say classically liberal and, and to some extent in me as well, that it's not okay that the, the community can apply so much pressure on you that you are terrified of leaving. The state should be involved in to some extent to prevent or to offset in order to respect the wishes of the individual to be in relationship to the group as they see fit. For me, the thing that stood out from the conversation with Yasha was actually, I asked him a question, kind of like, what what is it about diverse democracies that are essentially stronger democracies? And he corrected me, which was interesting, because I, I, I assumed that that was the premise of, of his argument. And he said, no, actually, you know, I, I could absolutely see that more homogeneous democracies are, are stronger. But the fact is the worms are out of the can on that one for the vast majority of democracies around the world. Like, and if you want to put the worms back in the can, that's a little genocide and a little scary. <laughs> so let's assume that we don't want that state of affairs just for the sake of having a stronger democracy. So then the question becomes, even if the if homogeneous democracies are safer, more stapler, let us assume that in this day and age, given the diversity of most of our uh, existing democracies, we have to figure out how to make diverse democracies just as st- strong and stable. The worms uh, that you're referring to is the fact that we are an incredibly integrated post-globalization world and we right. no longer have democracies that are simply outlined around 19th century vision of nation states. Well, the reason that Josh is making this point is because the populist movement that we are living through right now is exactly uh, conscious rebellion against um, the worms being out of the cage or a, a conscious attempt to <laughs> herd the right. worms back into the, the, the can. <laughs> By the way, I threw out that expression. I don't know if it's a real expression, I don't know, so I, hopefully I, we're not belaboring I, a, an uh, invented no, I, I mean, I mean, you hammer it in until it becomes. Uh, no, yeah, I've never heard it before, but I, I think there's a cat in the bag. Uh, there's a, um, there, there are several things that pop up of of the things, but I don't think worms and cans are right. Yeah, um, I don't think worms pair. really pop, but let's just pretend for the sake of this uh, analogy. <laughs> That's a horrific image if you think about it. The worms of democracy, the, the worms Popping of diversity, worms. pop out of the can of democracy. <laughs> So when you're looking at what's going on, obviously, in Hungary with Viktor Orban and in Israel with some of the more religious nationalist movements that have risen to power over the past few years, and in a weird, perverted way with Trump as well, and I say weird, perverted because the American nation is an experiment in diversity and immigration and genocide from the get-go and there is no there is no uh, blood and soil nation that is americans the oldest part of the waspy tribe will date themselves back to what the mayflower not only are they not indigenous to the land they are first of all not the majority of americans at all but also uh, come on like a, a nation born 400 years ago like give me a break this is not the sort of bond that those um semi to more than semi uh, racist writers of the 19th century spring of nations were, um, you know, fantasizing. But I should say, like, not all of them were necessarily racist. In many ways, the rise of nationalism in Europe was actually a great liberalizing uh, movement and created more autonomy for smaller states against empire with more responsiveness to um, the democratic needs of a particular people as opposed to having uh, a regime that is controlled on a continental level imposed on different groups with different interests and different identities. So the nationalist experiment was in many ways something that we should support. And my dear uh, friend with whom I have strong disagreements with, but I I would love to bring him on the podcast at some point, Gadi Taub, who is uh, a brilliant writer and a great scholar, 
and I have an interview with him, if anybody's interested in more context, that I wrote for the, the Huffington Post a while back. He always emphasized in his writing the connection between democracy and nationalism, that you don't really have one without the other in a true sense. And I think that's a perspective that you do need to have in the back of your mind when we're talking about these things. Um, and also shows why America itself is such a weird case, because number one, it's from its constitution, diverse and not really ethnically united. But also, it is the exact thing that nationalism came up against. It is an empire. It is a continent size behemoth rather than um, an experiment in, in small states. I mean, obviously, that was the, the original vision with the, what is it, 13 colonies that were supposed to be more autonomous. But this is certainly mm-hmm. not the face of the U.S. today. And barring some, as envisioned by David French, massive secession of states, mm-hmm. barring that, it, it is much closer in many ways to the empires that uh, the nationalist movement of Europe was trying to uh, remedy or break apart. So the U.S. is a weird case, mm-hmm. but we are recognizing that there is a movement around the world that responds to this instinct, the nationalist instinct, and to the idea that this is perhaps a better solution than than the the, the global, overly gentrified, overly united, samified, samified version of cosmopolitan internationalism. And um, maybe we should look closer at the people within our own borders and kind of reassert the values of these borders and prioritize our own folks, strengthen our identity, sharpen our differences. And that idea appeals to many people because they do feel the the wishy-washiness of an international regime. The populist movement, the nationalist movement is saying we need tighter borders both literal state borders, but also tighter cultural identitarian borders. I'm going to move us, since we're low on time, but I'm going to move us from tight, (laughs) place-based, populist borders that I can't necessarily get behind towards local, Hmm. more (laughs) character-filled, anti-internationalist architecture that I can get behind. And I'm going <laughs> to segue us to Vashon. That was the smoothest segue on our show. Wasn't it? Wasn't it? But the metaphor, I no, think, is true. actually pretty, pretty good, even if the segue was poor. I, no, I think you're right. And I think it's funny. This is this actually is is proving to be much more revealing to me, at least, than I expected in, in having this conversation and tying these uh, individual talks that we had I'm seeing through lines that I didn't didn't even fully recognize until now. Talk but my question is, where are the populists demanding the better urbanism on their local level? Where are the where are the teeny 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 populists? The blockalists. It, it's funny because cities are um, kind of like the United States when you're talking big nations. Cities offer a similar problem because on one hand, cities are have always been ground zero for diversity because people flock to cities from around the country, from around the world. People of different walks of life, of different ethnicities, of different cultures, and of different socioeconomic backgrounds. On the other hand, cities do have, or should have, and in, in we both agree, identities, a uniqueness that we see the value of protecting rather than let it be completely eroded. Although that's a different problem because you put your thumb on a scale and 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 you lead to stagnation rather than the the sort of dynamism and change inherent to cities. So, um, but but the point is that we have at least the instinct, if if not for the solution, then at least for the problem of we want to make sure that cities and and especially neighborhoods and like the smaller units get to have stronger control over their character and fight against its erosion. Right. And it, it's funny, it feels like the only way that Americans have been able to mobilize themselves in defense of character is through that kind of nimbyism. They've been able to say, like, no, stop. They've never been able to say, yes, this is what I want. Or maybe not never, that's too extreme. But at least in this current moment, it feels like Americans don't know what to ask for mm-hmm. when it comes to how do I have a built environment that reflects me and my neighborhood and my community. And I think that's what Vishan Chakrabarty, who's an urbanist architect, that's what we talked about towards the end of our conversation. There's a whole essentially capitalistic system set up that in- incentivizes our built environment to look 
banal and repetitive because there's economies of scale and it's easier for developers to just do what they've always done and get the factories pulling out what they've always made as opposed to local materials, local design techniques, local colors, whatever, and create something unique to a place. And that's the way that he and his uh, firm Practice for Architecture and Urbanism are trying to redefine beauty. They don't want to think about beauty as some sort of a platonic ideal. They want to think about it very practically in terms of what will make this thing, this building feel like of the place it is in. Beauty as something that's contextualized. It's the contextualization that defines the beauty. Correct. Right. Um, it's fascinating because it really does go to the point of, of locality versus everywhereness, right? It's the, it's the anywhere versus yeah. the somewheres um, model of, of sociology. It's funny how you have different ideas, almost contradictory ideas um, from people, depending on the scale where you apply this question. Mm, the people yes. who care so much about nationalism don't seem to be particularly right. prioritizing the, the uniqueness of cities. I mean, I, the, the thing is that also that comes with some baggage as well like on one hand you can say oh oh, this is a beautiful unique working class neighborhood with some interesting maybe artistic scene and and, and local culture and we don't want that to be eroded by the um by the affluent hipster horde that is gonna turn everything Mm -hmm. into uh, edison light bulb cafe but on the other hand this is the same story of of segregation. And there are a a lot of less tasteful or scrupulous reasons that people have wanted to keep um, others from moving in and from changing the local character. And we have a clear ethical distinction uh, intuitively that some of these concerns are legitimate and even potentially worthy, laudable, while others are uh, reprehensible. Yeah, and I think Vishan brings up that we need to get away from this, what he called Jane Jacobs, Robert Moses, what you could also just call David Goliath concept of who is who always has the right in these conversations when it comes to what we should have in our cities and who's always wrong. And it's not so black and white as all of that. Um, but we are running out of time, Adam. We are, oh, I'm no. about to get kicked out of this room. Should we... Oh. Should we end it on L- that? Let's let's give. We didn't get to talk about Christine. Yeah, I want to hear. I want to hear what you love about Christine. I just liked the diversity of topics that we talked about, from panic porn to kind of trauma. Um, and I also like that we got into the a little bit more personal stuff with like why or why not to be for marriage or like be anti or pronatalist. Um, I like it when we draw those through lines more between our personal lives Mm. and the concepts that we're talking about on uncertain things. And I feel like we could stand to do that a little bit more. We do a better job in the newsletter, actually, than we do sometimes in the conversations, maybe because of the time crunch that we are under in the interview. Also, there's, uh, depending on the guests, but there there are many guests you can wonder. I don't know how interesting it's going to be for you to hear my my background story now. But (laughs) that's it. That's it. I I, I think there must be um, some drinking game about how many times I, 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 I do start with the identitarian as an Israeli well, so just to really quickly end on yeah. things that we need sound effects for so sure as an Israeli <laughs> Noam Chomsky <laughs> cognitive dissonance gotta get we gotta get some some sort of sound effect for this and this anytime we we mention the end of the world <laughs> I think those are our sound effect worthy talking points the last points. one is not fair because that's the the premise of the show it, when people do write the history of um, podcasting um, in 2000 <laughs> teens and, and early 20s maybe it will be you again writing the history of pods maybe it will be me the people who don't know Vanessa Vanessa has written one of the earliest um, summations of the development and uh, um, podcast movement like what 10 years ago things have changed since seven years ago seven years ago the interesting thing to look at this burst of pandemic pods to see there has to be a subgenre of uh eschatological end of end times mm. uh inspired podcast of of sense making um different Different creators have taken different approaches, obviously, but I, I, I am sure that this uh, fits into some uh, bigger umbrella. Of uncertain pods. I think none has a better theme song than ours. Mm. That's another thing I realized listening back to all of the episodes. I, that, that song is still great. 
<laughs> every single, I just listen to it every single time. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I do. Also, I also think we have a better name than most. I think we have a good name. Well, um, with that, listeners, Vanessa, um, my mom, who's in the other side of the room, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, this was an interesting year. Year. Let's have a better 2023. Yeah. Better. Everything. Be- be- <laughs> better. Healthier, Whatever better means to you. Happier. Wealthier. Um, all the good things. Give us five stars as our end of the year Christmas present. Yes, we 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 promise you that there are real guests coming up. You won't have to suffer our our self indulgence. Uh, <laughs> Just us again. Yeah, uh, for yeah. Although, if you do like our self indulgence, then um, um, pay the schmeckles in the sub stack, and you'll get some um, some more uh, of that. Subscribe so, to the newsletter. Subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, yeah. And subscribe to We'll see you next year. Stay safe. Share us with your friends and enemies. <laughs> et cetera, et cetera.